Welcome to the Athlete's First Performance Podcast, where two performance-minded physical therapists break down the evidence to improve overall health, movement, and performance for athletes and active individuals. Nate, it's good to have you on. Good to see you. It's been a while. Yeah, it has. It's been a, it's been a few months since we last chatted. Uh, it's been a yeah. It's been a, it's been a while. It, you know, I think relocated since the last time we talked. Yeah, lots of different moves, lots of new things going on. Um, so, for those that don't know who you are, why don't you just give us a brief introduction, who you are, where you're from, and a little bit of background and uh, what got you into PT school. So my name is Nate. Uh, I'm currently a physical therapist that lives in Rochester, New York. Um, I, I grew up in New York, uh, played kind of my background, you know, traditional, you know, played football, played baseball growing up, uh, ended up getting injured. Uh, and I feel like most people that get injured in high school or have any serious injuries end up becoming physical therapists because they're like, oh, this is cool. I like this. Uh, so uh, I ended up going to Lemoyne playing baseball there. Uh, after Lemoyne, I ended up going to Stony Brook down on Long Island uh, and went there for physical therapy school. And then I did some clinical rotations. Uh, my brother lives in Boston, so I lived, I did, I lived with him for a month, did a rotation there uh, in the summer. Uh, and then I spent six months, which is where I met you, James, down in South Carolina. Um, and after that, um, I moved back up to, to New York, upstate New York, because I had a hospital system that I was helping pay for schooling. So I had to go back there for three years. Um, so when I was there, I did traditional outpatient physical therapy, uh, ended up getting my OCS, um, on the hospital's dime. I, I, I tried to squeeze at any, every penny I could get out of that hospital system. Uh, and then that's where I met my fiance. Uh, in Binghamton, uh, and we both knew that we didn't want to stay in Binghamton, so we relocated to Rochester about two years ago, uh, worked in a uh, private outpatient clinic, and then because her, um, we, got, we ended up getting a dog, and she was starting to do some travel nurses, I ended up doing home health, um, just to have the flexibility to take care of the dog and take care of the, the things around the house. Um, and uh, so I've been in home care for about a, a year, and I have um, also it was in the last year I've started my own business, uh, Energy Health, uh, which really focuses on on treating CrossFit athletes and baseball players on the side. So, how is that transition from uh, from traditional outpatient to home health, and eventually starting your own practice? So, I think one of the things that when you when you think of the traditional outpatient setting, uh, as a as a physical therapist, you know you're working the seven a.m. shift, and then the next day you're closing at the, the seven p.m. shift, and it really kind of hinders like some of your your flexibility during the day, and you have patients coming in and out, uh, and so switching to home care, it kind of showed me that oh, like there's you can be a physical therapist and you can have job flexibility, and and you can uh, you know, if you need to go to a doctor's appointment, you can kind of rearrange your schedule. And it showed me that there's a different way of uh, being a physical therapist. Uh, you know, I, I miss the outpatient orthopedic. I miss the challenge of it. Um, but, you know, being at home health, it's a different skill set. And you're, you're learning more of the medical side. Uh, and so my goal with, with energy is to eventually is to kind of have that flexibility with treating crossfitters and and, uh, and baseball players that I have with home health. So you're kind of doing both at the same time. So are you doing full-time home health or is that a part-time gig on top of energy health? So it's a, it's a full-time, um, it's a full-time home health job. And what I've been doing over the last year was I'd be working Tuesday and Thursday nights at, out of a chiropractic office um, that I, if anyone knows the Institute of Clinical Excellence, they have ex they have great kind of courses. Um, it was a Cairo that I met at one of those courses, and, and we kind of hit it off. And you know, they were kind of supportive of me trying to 
start my own thing. So, you know, they let me rent some space from six hours a week. Uh, and then in June, uh, this past year, um, I got engaged and we bought a house, uh, and we spent the last few months renovating. So, um, now that, you know, so it was kind of, I've had growth at the beginning, kind of had, um, the six hours kind of literally how much I could grow. Uh, and so we kind of went through a stagnant phase and then now what I'm looking to do, and, it, and it's, which is exciting is that in January, uh, I'm going to be opening up, uh, my own actual little spot in my CrossFit gym. So that that's my goal is to hopefully, um, expand it more than that, just the six hours that I had over the last year. Okay. So are you going to keep your home health job as you expand into that CrossFit gym? Yeah. So the plan is, uh, is to keep my home health job and then eventually scale it down as I scale the other one up, you know, unfortunately, uh, when you become an adult, you need health insurance, you need benefits, you need all that. So mm-hmm. I really need the home health job for those. Uh, and then after we get married, uh, maybe I'll just use my wife's benefits, but you know, it's also, I, I kind of like the home health. It's it's just a different, um, just a different environment. When you go to someone's home, like you really get to know them and you get to kind of see what their life is actually like. You know, a lot of times when you're an outpatient or even you're in the hospital, like you're kind of making assumptions on what their lifestyle is like and like what they need. Uh, whereas when you're in the home, you're like, Oh, this is what your stairs look like. All right. We need to do it this way. Or this is how you get out of the house. Or like I had a, patient yesterday where um he said he was went into the garage and he lives with his grandson and his fiance and uh basically like it ended up being that like you could get out through the garage and that was a much safer option than going out through the patio and i was like you guys should just put a grab bar here and and then it'll be a lot easier in the winter time being in new york like you gotta you gotta prepare for the snow and and uh sleet and the ice and i mean you know you're from chicago it's oh yeah yeah it, it gets it gets bad in the winter and it, it, you know you, when you're an outpatient you just kind of make some assumptions but in home health like you have no excuses not to know exactly how to solve a problem i mean i've never i've never done home health but i have a lot of friends from pt school that have transitioned kind of like you have um, from outpatient ortho to full-time home health. And I was just with some of the guys uh, this past weekend and they were telling me how they really enjoy it. So yeah, it's definitely, definitely an option in terms of physical therapy and pretty good salaries as well. So, um, so how did you decide on that CrossFit niche with energy health? How'd you get into that? So when I was still living in Binghamton, um, you know, it's actually kind of funny. So there's, I was playing slippery softball. We had a double header and this is maybe a year out of PT school. And I swung and I, and I pulled my oblique and I was like, geez, oh, that hurts really bad. And then the second game, I was like, oh, I can barely move. Uh, and then the second game I pulled my hamstring and I'm like, this is ridiculous. I was like, I'm 26 years old. I need, it's like, I need to start working out again. Like I can't just go to the YMCA. You know, I, I did it. I worked out at one of those kind of semi-private model, uh, but really what ended up happening was like, they would just send me to the open equipment. Uh, and then there was a CrossFit gym that was pretty popular in the area. Uh, and so I was like, you know what? I'm going to do CrossFit. Like I want to do something that gets my heart rate up and knows that like when I'm done, I worked out hard. Uh, and so then when I ended up doing after I started doing CrossFit for like a month or two, it was probably 2019. It was right before the pandemic. Uh, I probably did it for about six to seven months before the pandemic. And I just realized how much better these CrossFit coaches were at coaching movement and understanding movement. Uh, you know, and it's funny, like as a physical therapist, we often say that we're the, uh, we understand movement the best, you know, like, and I just realized like, these guys know way more about these complex movements than I, than I do. And it was kind of intimidating. And then I just decided that, all right, I'm going to learn as much as I can from these guys. Um, 
And I ended up finding, I mentioned the Institute of Clinical Excellence. I think I did, um, they're, they have a clinical management fitness athlete certification. And I did that. Um, I got my L1, uh, which I haven't coached, but you know, I was just like, I just need to get this knowledge and, and try to figure out how to be better at being a physical therapist. And I think getting into the CrossFit world has made me a better therapist just because I, I'm doing more complex movement myself. So I, I kind of understand what my threshold is and like what I need to work on. And then I can kind of portray that onto other people. Uh, and then also just the methodology and, and the programming is so much different than what, the traditional ones that you get from like the national strength and conditioning association or, or what you kind of get in college. Um, so it's been a good, it's been a good fit. You know, it's funny. I, I was talking to my fiance and I was like, Oh, I really been doing CrossFit for like three or so years at a pandemic in there. So maybe it's like a year and a half. Well, I don't know how, how I'll calculate the pandemic, but you know, it's, it's interesting to see how much I've, grown as a crosser in the last three years and then there's things that i still suck at you know like you know i can do pull-ups but like i can't do a, a bar muscle up or i can't um my front squat's getting better but you know i still have limited mobility in my left shoulder um, so it's it's something that like i think you can't hide in crossfit you know your your limitations are shown and then you just got to keep working on them I completely agree with talking about PTs being movement ex experts, or we think that we're movement experts, like those CrossFit coaches or any type of coaches, they're seeing 20, 30 athletes every hour. And they're just getting those reps and being able to see movement, assess movement and coach movement. And most PTs are seeing what, eight to 20 people per day. So, and they might not even be doing those high intensity movements or the Olympic lifting. So I think as a, as a PT, it's important to have your own movement practice, whether it be CrossFit or yoga or whatever, just being able to get into those movements. Just like you said, if you're limited with shoulder mobility, that's limiting your front squat or gymnastics, how can you use your own skill set as a PT to help improve those movements and positions personally in the gym? And that'll carry over to your patient care. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's like having your own movement, like if, it, if it's yoga, um, Pilates, swimming. You know, I think the biggest thing is like what we have in this country is we just have a movement problem. Like we have, you know, if you look at the chronic diseases, you know, diabetes, high blood pressure, a lot of them can be solved with exercise. You, you know, it's you know if you just start moving you're going to feel a lot better. And, you know, that's one of the things where I think, I, like you said, like as a physical therapist, we're movement experts. You know, a lot of times, like the first thing we do as PTs, is we just get people moving again. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then, uh, then I was going to say, and then once they're moving, then we talk about how, to, how do we improve the movement quality? You know? No, I a hundred percent agree. So with your business, how are you kind of marketing to these athletes? Like, you're joining a gym. Are you telling people that you're a PT or are you kind of just working yourself into the gym? And then as you get to know people, start talking and things of that nature. Yeah. So I think over the last year, I've been at this gym for like a year and a half now. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is just for marketing is just showing up and being a CrossFitter, you, you know, like people want to know that you do the movements and that you're one of them. Like it, it's a very, I'm not going to call it clicky because I mean, if you go to a CrossFit gym, people are pretty accepting. They're not mm -hmm. going to like turn you away. Um, but they're, they're hesitant to, to work with some healthcare providers. A lot of the, a lot of the stigma that has been associated with CrossFit has been negative. Uh, and so people are like, Oh, you do CrossFit. Like you're just going to get injured. And that's not, and, and like they've, if they've had an injury in the past, they go to a provider and they say like, oh, stop doing CrossFit. Like that's the last thing mm -hmm. someone wants to hear. You know, like if you go to a runner and you say, oh, stop running, uh, they're still going to run. You know, a CrossFit is still going to do CrossFit. You just have to figure out how to modify scale 
keep them in the gym because a lot of times in the CrossFit community, like that's their friend group. And so they just want to still be around their friends and feel like they're not being isolated. Uh, and so um, to get back to your question on um, how am I doing marketing? Um, a lot of it has just been kind of word of mouth from the coaches. And now that I think when come January, when I'm actually going to be in the space, um, I think people are going to see what I do and how I do things a little differently. And I'm hoping it'll just grow. Um, so a lot of it has just been word of mouth um, because I, I think one of the things that I think I'm pretty good at is, you know, I just try to get to know my patients or, or clients or athletes. And then once we're done after the injury, like we're still in touch, we're still friends. Like, you know, it's developing a relationship that'll last longer than the, the PT sessions. Yeah, for sure. You'll see them in the community, see them in the gym. So there's always that constant communication and, and those touch points, even once they're done working with you. So where did you get some of this knowledge in terms of like starting to do your own thing, start your own business? Where did you learn how to do that? So honestly, it started during the pandemic. Um, I was out of work for two, three months being an outpatient PT. Uh, and I just realized that like, you know, we're the same age. So like when we were in high school, looking to college, like the 08 recession hit and it seemed like everyone was saying like, everyone was like losing their job and parents were, just, my parents were just like going to healthcare. Like you'll always have a job. People always need to get recovered. And then here I am at 26, 27, 28, already out of a job for three months. And I'm like, geez, like if a hospital is not safe, like, I got to figure out something. It's like, I want to have kids. I want to have something that like is stable or, or that like I can control. Uh, so that's when I started, you know, I started listening to like Danny Mate, um, talking about like cash PT uh, and just thinking about different ways that you can do physical therapy, how you can run one. Um, one of the things that's like appealing about cash PT is like, you don't need all the front office staff. Like you can do it yourself. Like you, and I was just trying to figure out like, all right, how can I run a business that's pretty lean and that I can do by myself and give me that flexibility that I need. Uh, so, so it started during the pandemic. Um, it was just an idea. Uh, and then I just kept rolling and rolling. Uh, and then come into Rochester, um, you know, I had a re it was kind of like, all right, like I need to connect with people. I need to figure out like how I can actually make this happen. And that's when I met the Cairo, uh, Sarah and, and Mike, and they helped me out. And they actually got me like, oh, just give me an opportunity to like get it going. Uh, and so this last year was a lot of trial and error. Uh, and then I realized that I didn't really want to do the traditional cash PT. And so then I, and that was only after, um, I found like the Honey Badger Project, um, which is a group that they call themselves an incubator. And I'm actually going to start working with them on Friday to help launch my uh, kind of rebranding when I start in January. Um, and it was just talking about how, um, you know, cash PT versus outpatient PT, it's still the same thing. You know, you're still trading an hour of your time for an hour of uh, service. Uh, and their whole thing about being hybrid is using technology using education, um, really trying to create a, uh, a better overall product where you have, like, you know, you have a traditional PT session, but then you have some education resources uh, that you can provide them and that you've already created and you can reuse. So like you're kind of leveraging your time to create resources for people. So they're getting a little bit more value than they do in that in traditional um, PT setting. And then also doing some programming uh, where, um, like I have one patient right now where, you know, the last six weeks we've met twice, but I've been programming every week and I've been putting two workouts together and we've been progressing over the last 12, 12 weeks, uh, the last three months. And we can see the progression and, and it's all through using an app called um, Everfit. And it's kind of like train heroic or true coach. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just something where I'm like, all right, how do I provide more value? But it also 
give them the same value that they would see with me in person, but also I can see them longer and make sure that over that course of three months, because you know, like in, in an outpatient, that once someone's out of pain, their insurance is done. So this kind of like allows me to create this whole three month process where, you know, the first month we're getting a lot of pain. The second month, you know, we're touching base every two weeks, the third month, every two to three weeks and in person. And it's just trying to figure out, okay, how do I create that flexibility that I get in home care where I'm like, all right, like I can, I can control my schedule, but also provide a much better product where people are like, okay, like, I understand my injury a lot better. I've seen the progress. Now I can kind of self-manage this long-term. No, I really like that. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the Honey Badger Project. Who runs that or what are they affiliated with? So it's two co-owners, uh, Frank Benedito and Cedric Hassan, I guess that's his name is. Uh, um, it's just Frank and Cedric. Um, I haven't really talked to Frank. I've talked mostly to Cedric. Um, but I'm excited about it because uh, – it it's exciting to work with people that are trying to create something that's new and not really like the same cookie cutter product. Uh, and so my two niches are going to be CrossFit and baseball because I'm um, a varsity assistant baseball coach at a high school in the area. Um, okay. And so it's the, so it's the two things that are like, I'm kind of passionate about and it's like, all right, how do I work with the people I want to? And then just, kind of make sure that I provide quality services, but also like I can, let's say I can create a podcast like this, or I can create a, a well, not zoom loom uh, is like a video recording program where I can kind of record a, a lecture, like a three to four minute video and I can educate people. And then I can just kind of send that, send those resources to people. So it, it gets me excited that, there's a different way to do things and it might be, uh, and it gets me excited about being a physical therapist again, being, you know, being five years in, uh, and it gets, uh, and I think it can deliver some good results. Yeah. And I think that a hybrid model is going to be kind of the wave of the future, right? It's already starting. Most people are able to work remotely or work from home, just using all the online resources. So, I guess, I mean, if you're able to set up your systems and processes and kind of record all those videos and using the coaching apps, it's definitely something that people need to look into in terms of the in-clinic one-on-one sessions, plus whatever extra programming or resources that you can provide them. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we're getting to the age where we want to have kids and have a family and you don't really see too many older clinicians. Uh, And I think a lot of that has to do with you know, you don't want to be working until seven o'clock at night every night or getting up early. Like you want to be able to be in control of your schedule. And when you're a clinical therapist, you know, you, you don't really, when the patient is available, that kind of dictates when you're available. Uh, so this kind of is kind of a workaround where, you know, you can decide your schedule, but also still give the patient the flexibility and the independence they need. Um, because I think that's one of the things I've noticed especially with a CrossFit athlete is that they're very independent individuals and we're not, we're just guiding their recovery, you know? And so a lot of times the programming is what will help. They, they just need to be educated on what to do yeah. and they don't need their handheld. Uh, and so they, and so far what I've noticed is that they respond pretty well to that. Um, and they, they like the independence that like, because everyone has the same, you know, we, we all have 24 hours in a day. Um, you know, if I give someone a program to do, they do it in the morning, do it at night. We don't have to find that same time in our schedules. So it gives them kind of that, that control over their time again. Do you think that you'll ever use that L1 to coach at the CrossFit gym? I think it would help me be a better PT. Um, I think... Right now we have a lot of good coaches there. Uh, so there's really not a lot of space for me to coach. Um, and I'm just trying to think from a time frame standpoint, like I'm, you know, I'm going to be pretty busy once this kind of launches in January. 
that I'm trying to figure out how not to be too time poor, you know, trying to find that balance. Um, it was interesting. I just watched a interview with ever seen JJ Reddick interview his podcast. No, I know he has a pretty good podcast. I just haven't listened to it. Yeah. To he was, he was interviewing Hassan Minaj, like comedian. Mm-hmm. And he was just talking about um, what being a great athlete or, or a great person was. And he was talking about how, who he thinks is like phenomenal, Steve Kerr. Like he, you know, he won championships with the Bulls. He became a GM. He became, uh, you know, a Hall of Fame coach. Uh, but his dad also died when he was really young. Uh, mm-hmm. But he's still around for his kids. And just talking about, like, the whole aspect of, you know, not just your work of art for your length of your life. Um, so, you know, we talk about, like, Jordan being the greatest ever. Uh but, you know, like his personal life was awful. You know, like yeah. he was not, you know, Ted Williams was like the same way. Like Ted Williams had a ton of affairs. And he was a horrible dad. But like we we only look at the sports aspect. Uh, and so um, I guess when I think about being time poor, it's like, how do I use my time so that I like, I don't take away from my relationship. I don't take away from being, you know, a physical therapist, you know, trying to be good at everything but not trying to take away from something else. And tell me about the coaching. I didn't know that you were coaching baseball as well. Yeah. So I started coaching uh, last year. Um, We were coaching JV and one of my buddies was like, Hey Nate, like you want to help out? And once I switched to home health, like I had flexibility in the afternoon. So I would work energy Tuesdays and Thursdays and I'd be coaching Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And it was great. Like I really enjoyed being around the kids. You know, you kind of forget how much you miss being around the game. I'm sure, you know, like, you know, you play football in college, like watching a game is not the same as preparing or or developing a game plan. Uh, And so just trying to teach these kids how to have a approach to hitting or playing solid defense or understanding how to, you know, track down a fly ball um, and you can see their growth over time like it, it was exciting to be around we ended up having a pretty good season i think we're like 13 and 4 13 and 5 nice um and so um there for some reason there was some the, the varsity coach got let go uh, my buddy got promoted to varsity uh, so we're, we're going to take those same kids and take them to the varsity level and, and now go compete hopefully for a section title and onto States and see where we can go. So it's going to be fun. Yeah. Now that definitely sounds a lot of fun, especially if your buddy's a head coach. Um, Have you been able to implement any like arm care programs or things of that nature within the team? So we haven't implemented anything just yet. Um, You know, we'll, we'll start to, you know, we're going to have like one practice on Sunday, um, but it won't be, I think until like January where we'll start to try to ramp some things up throwing wise and, and really try to get these guys arms ready. Um, I want to look into doing some education stuff with um, driveline, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of, and just kind of use some of their resources and, and try to understand the pitching and, and try to keep these kids healthy as possible. Cause that's one of the things where all these kids most likely want to play on in college but you know it's very hard to get recruited when you're injured for sure so uh we got to develop something to keep them healthy and keep them injured or free from injury so yeah that, that, that's gonna be in the works over the next few weeks is putting that together yeah no doubt all the ucl injuries that's happening in these little league and high school kids it's it's crazy yeah i mean quite honestly i, I think some of it has to do with the fact that these kids are getting stronger at a much earlier age. And it's all about everything I see is, all right, how do we can get you 10 miles per hour faster? And you're like, okay, but, you know, kids are throwing harder, but like, are they accurate? Are they developing their off speed? Uh, So it'll be interesting to see um, trying to prevent that because, when these kids are, I think these kids are a lot more athletic than we were even 10 years ago mm-hmm. at a high school level. And so they're just 
putting more and more stress on their arm as they get stronger. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Have you looked into on base you at all? Yeah, I did. Um, cause I did the TPI thing. Yeah. Um, and I, and and I was debating doing that one or the, or looking to drive line, but I think what I've realized is that a lot of the stuff I probably got from the TPI is similar from on base U. Yeah. Whereas I think the drive line people are, are more baseball specific. So I think I might just go the drive line route, but I thought about it. Yeah. I've never done the on base U, but I've done like the SFMA, FMS and TPI. So yeah, it's all based on the same stuff. Um, I've seen some of driveline stuff. I know they have some of the weighted ball programs, um, yeah. but do they have like, you said like a biomechanics of like pitching and hitting, they have all that stuff. Yeah. They have a little bit about that. Um, I think for me, it's more about trying to stay up to date on like what kids are being taught from a pitching wise. Um, okay. Because I think, things have changed in like the last 10 years, even like swings have changed, you know, like everyone's trying to hit fly balls, home runs now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was in high school, it was like, all right, like hit line drives, home runs will come. Um, so I think sometimes it's just trying to educate myself to get back up to speed on like what the current trends are. And that's what kind of why I'm thinking more drive line. Um, and then I can kind of learn the, learn the biomechanics, um, yeah. well they i mean they still have biomechanics mm -hmm. there but i mean there's so many resources now like you got mike reynold that champion um you got kevin wolf like there's just so many baseball pts that i feel like you can just get that information from one of those as well yeah for sure you can definitely, yeah you can get down the rabbit hole really quick on baseball physical therapy and performance that's its own little world there I was only in that world for like a year and a half when I was in South Carolina. So probably out of date with all the baseball and the elbow stuff. Yeah. It's baseball players are just a weird group of people. Yeah. Especially pitchers. Very oh, yeah. quirky. A lot of very superstitious. Um, you know, I was just a hitter. So I had to spend too much time with them, but I mean, the things those guys are doing in the bullpen, like one, I don't think we can talk about it. And two, I don't want to know about it. <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. So do you have any closing thoughts as we wrap up this podcast? Like if people are looking to kind of branch out and do their own thing, either hybrid or just like cash PT, do you have any things that they should pay attention to or look out for if they're getting into that world? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing, if you're looking to branch out and like do your own thing is one, just understand that like you're going to have a lot of doubt and you're, and you're going to um, kind of doubt yourself as like a clinician, as a business person. Like it's just the nature of the, of the beast when you're by yourself um, Two, when things go well, it's well worth it. Uh, and three, find a mentor. I mean, I think the best thing that you can do is try to find a coach that will help you learn what you need to do. Um, cause it's a very overwhelming process. You know, like I started this in 2020 and we're two years in, you know, the first year was just trying to get all the business aspect done, like all the behind the scenes, like the, the LLC and uh, making sure everything's like in good legal standing and, and that make sure you're not breaking any laws. Uh, and that took a long time, you know, that took like six months to get everything lined up and then, um, then there's a move and then trying to find a location. Like it, it's a, it's a process, but you know, it's been, I think well worth it because I'm trying to create the life that I want. And so I can live the life and be the dad and, and the husband and the person that I want to be uh, outside the clinic. Uh, and so I think when I look at, um, like, I guess my closing thought is, if you want to live your life a certain way and you're, you're a very driven individual, you know, open up your business. It gives you that flexibility to try to do things to give you the life you want and, and do things how you think is the best way that you could do. And um, I think that's about it. Yeah. 
I like it. Definitely food for thought. Um, I know there's probably some people listening to this, especially uh, newer PTs or PTs that have been working for about three to five years that are kind of rethinking some of their, their uh, next moves. So this will definitely give them some food for thought and some information on how to move forward or how to better their, uh, their career or lifestyle as a PT. Yeah, exactly. I hope I provide some insight. Yeah, for sure. So if anyone wants to reach out, um, reach out to you or find you, where can they find you? So my uh, website is energyhealth.fit. Uh, my email is nate at energyhealth.fit. Um, you know, just send me an email um, and or you can message me on, on Instagram. It's at uh, energy, uh, N-R-G dot health on Instagram. Um, and just reach out. I'll answer any questions. Uh, I think the biggest thing is just try to pass on the information I've learned to someone else. Um, because we're all, there's enough patients to treat out there. Um, you know, let's just help each other out. Yeah. Yeah. I'll definitely link all that information in the show notes. And, uh, yeah, you've been putting out a lot of good stuff on Instagram. So getting back on that train again. So looking forward to see what you put out and, um, we'll definitely have to keep in touch and let me know how everything goes in January when you, uh, start it back up. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Athletes First Performance Podcast. If you have any questions regarding this episode or future episodes, please be sure to reach out on social media or our website. Both links can be found in the show notes.